Hi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is you're watching this. And as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching it. Welcome to edition 50 of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for March 29th to April 4th, 2012. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. And for the next almost half hour, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things that are important to me, I think deserve your attention. Uh, as always, any comments, questions, plaudits, brickbats, whatever, can be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And uh, if you didn't catch that, and I figure you probably didn't, uh, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up eh, around here somewhere a couple times during the show. And uh, you can get the email address from there. I do answer my email, sometimes a little slow about it. But the one thing I request is that uh, if you do email me to include something like uh, left side of the aisle or your cable show or something like that in the subject line so I know it's not spam. Okay? So with that onward, I've got a um, couple of things. I've been last several weeks, I've been trying to you know, get in as much as I can because there's so much stuff. This week, I kind of decided I was going to pretty much limit myself to, uh, to one topic for most of the time. Uh, but so I'm going to start actually with again a bit of good news. I always like to start with good news when I can. This is sort of tempered good news. It's uh, but it's uh, you know it's overall it's a plus. Uh, what was done? The Obama administration has finally, finally, finally proposed uh, standards to cut carbon emissions from new power plants. Finally. Uh, these, these rules would primarily affect coal-fired plants because uh, coal plants are not as efficient in controlling uh, carbon emissions as the newer, more efficient natural gas plants are. In fact, the, under the regs, the coal-fired plants would have to reduce their emissions to be no worse than the um, natural gas plants. Now, the power industry, of course, is against this, as are their bought and paid for lackeys in Congress, both among uh, the, the, the goppers and uh, as well as uh, a lot of the Democrats from energy producing states. There is a downside to the rules, uh, which is why it's, it's still a plus, but um, the downside is that these rules only apply to new plants. They don't apply to old plants. They don't apply to modified or, re modified or retrofitted plants, only to new ones, which sort of limits the applicability. But um, still, overall, it's better to have done this than not to have done it. The thing is, there's also a hidden downside here, and this is a lot more important. Uh, supporters of these new regulations say that one of the reasons we can do this and we can regulate, in essence, these coal-fired plants is that there is a trend among the electric power industry toward natural gas as opposed to coal. Uh, natural gas is cleaner than coal. You know, it's relatively clean as fossil fuels go. Uh, it's relatively cheap as fossil fuels go, and it's abundant. The downside, the hidden snag on this, lies in the cheap and abundant part. It would seem like a good thing. The problem is the reason natural gas is cheap and abundant is because of the increased use of what is called hydraulic fracturing, or fracking for short, in drilling operations. Now, what fracking involves, very simply, is forcing fluid under high pressure down the well to um, to fracture, cause fractures in surrounding rock near, near the drill head um, so that uh, materials caught in that rock can then be pumped out. I mean, again, put, putting, it, putting it very simply, the idea in effect is to try to create a tiny earthquake around the drill head so that any gas or oil that had been trapped in that rock is now free and can be pumped out. The problem is that fracking is well, the polite term would be controversial. The less polite term would be to call it a, another industry scam to maximize profit while not giving a damn about the public health and safety. Particularly over the past few years, there have been a number of cases uh, where people have argued that fracking and drilling operations have contaminated the air, the land, and most particularly the water supplies. Uh, cases have arisen in Alabama, Colorado, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Texas, Wyoming, Louisiana, all these places. 
Now, industry, of course, claims it has absolutely nothing to do with them. Apparently, according to the industry, all these people had been drinking benzene-laced water for years on end, and only now, for some absurd reason, decided to make a fuss about it. As of February this year, February 2012, fracking is being done in 31 states with very little regulation, pretty much out of sight and mind, except to those directly affected. Only four of those 31 states have any real rules regulating this drilling. Only five of them have any disclosure requirements about the materials used. And um, even those five doesn't really mean anything because they still allow for concealing proprietary trade secrets. And the thing is, the more important thing here, though, is that fracking um, is exempt It's exempt from at least portions of seven major federal environmental uh, laws and regulations, including the Clean Air Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Resource Recovery and Conservation Act, which uh, involves how industry deals with the hazardous waste it produces, and the Superfund. It's exempt from all of these. Now, I will say... In fairness to the industry, one thing is true. Fracking is not a new technology. It was first demonstrated in 1947. It's been used commercially since 1948. It's been around as long as I have. The thing is, though, the hydraulic fracturing, fracking, as it is done now, is significantly different than as in earlier years. Uh, For one thing, the pressure used is much higher. It's like 50 to 100% higher than used to be used. Um, The length of the operation is longer. They do it for up to three and four days now, which not only means there's a lot more fracturing of the rock, it also means they use three to four times as much water as they used to. It's also, it's only relatively recently that fracking has been used in horizontal drilling. I mean, the old vertical wells, how we used to all picture that, just drilling straight down, they don't do that much anymore. Now it's what's called horizontal drilling. You basically drill down and go sideways. Using fracking in that kind of well is relatively recent. And uh, perhaps most importantly, the complexity of the chemical cocktail used in the process is much greater than it used to be. Now, again, the contents of those, of those uh, cocktails, the companies don't have to reveal. They're trade secrets. But we do know that those contents include benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylene, all of which are known carcinogens. This apparently, though, is why we can regulate uh, coal-fired power plants, because we have fracking to fall back on, and we can just pollute our water supplies instead of our air. And the point is, we can once again trust our health and our energy and environmental futures to the very people who profit most by protecting them the least. Just goes to show that as so often happens with President Hopi Changi, no good deed goes unpunished. As a sort of footnote to that, uh, there are dozens of grassroots organizations which are now in, in the state of New York, which are organizing to block allowing fracking in New York State. Well, Governor Andrew, damn straight, I'm not my father, Cuomo, says a decision on this is likely in several months. He said this shortly after blocking a $100,000 appropriation to do an independent health study of the effects of fracking, which I rather strongly suspect gives us a pretty good idea of on what side that future decision is going to come down. But getting back to our only president, he has actually taken to bragging about how much oil drilling has increased during his administration. And he did that just recently while announcing that he has ordered federal agencies to fast track an oil pipeline from Cushing, Oklahoma to the Gulf Coast of Texas. Now, why is this particular pipeline so important? It deserves this special announcement. It's the southern portion of the Keystone XL pipeline. This is intended to carry tar sands from Alberta, Canada to Texas. When TransCanada, which is the outfit that wants to build the pipeline, couldn't get approval for the whole deal, 
Uh, in fact, just a couple of weeks ago, I reported as good news the fact that the Senate had killed an attempt to fast track the whole pipeline. TransCanada broke the project into two parts, northern part and the southern part, and it's that southern part of that pipeline which the amazing Mr. O has now said that uh, he wants his agencies to approve. I've talked about this pipeline a couple of times before um, and about the tar sands it's intended to carry. So I'm just going to mention here very quickly, tar sands are about the worst, the most environmentally destructive, the most environmentally dirty way to get oil there is. In 2010, the EPA calculated that on a well to tank basis, that is across the entire production range, uh, oil from tar sands produces more than 82% more greenhouse gas emissions than getting oil from typical crude oil does. In other words, it produces close to twice as much in greenhouse gases. And that, in turn, brings up something else I haven't talked about in a while, but uh, something that, in fact, as someone recently mentioned, has almost disappeared from the discussion of the Keystone XL pipeline. Global warming, or climate change if you prefer, yes, the two mean exactly the same thing. Um, this has to be put back in. It has to. Because the evidence that the effects of global warming are not just somewhere out in the, in the future, but are actually here now, that evidence is growing day by day. There is a study published in the peer-reviewed journal uh, Nature Climate Change just Sunday, March 25th. It said that extreme weather events over the past decade have increased, and quoting the study, this is a quote, it is very likely that several of the unprecedented extremes of the past decade would not have occurred without anthropogenic global warming. Quoting again, there is now strong evidence linking specific events or an increase in their number to the human influence on climate. This past decade was probably the warmest globally in over a thousand years. Uh, it's seen record hot summers in Europe. 2010 was the hottest summer in Russia in over 500 years. Uh, it has, this decade has seen a year with, the, with a record number of tropical storms and hurricanes in the Atlantic. It has seen severe floods in Europe. It is a decade that has seen in Pakistan the, um, the worst floods in that nation's history. In, in just in 2011 alone, the U.S. experienced 14 extreme weather events, each of which produced over a billion dollars in damage. Uh, and in fact, just a couple of weeks ago, March 13th to 19th, just, you know, a week, uh, a week to two weeks ago, over a thousand places in North America recorded record high temperatures in that period. You want to know how bad this is? You want to know how bad this is? In the 30-year in the period, 1951 to 1980, in that 30-year period, about 0.1% to 0.2% of the total land surface of the Earth experienced extremely hot summers. Now, 10% of the Earth's surface experiences extremely hot summers. And in fact, this may be accelerating. According to a study just published, uh, in the, again, another peer-reviewed journal, this one called Nature Geoscience. By 2050, global average temperature could be 1.4 to 3 degrees Celsius warmer than just a couple of decades ago at a time when, as this graph shows, um, the warming trend was already well underway. This is as much as three quarters of a degree Celsius warmer than the predictions of the last report of the, international, uh, of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Now, three quarters of a degree doesn't sound like much, but another way to put this is that this means that temperatures could be increasing as much as 25% faster than we previously thought. There was a, a conference uh, on climate change uh, in London just this past Monday, March 25th, uh, 26th. Scientists at that conference said that the Earth is approaching several tipping points. Now, a tipping point is a point beyond which, for that particular thing, the effects of warming are going to continue no matter what we do after that point. It's like you're already on the downside. It's too late. The ball is already rolling under its own gravity. Um, 
So the, the point is, you can think of it as a point of no return. Well, two, two examples of this that people are particularly concerned about are ice sheets and rainforests. Now, both of those help to um, limit, ameliorate global warming. The ice sheets do it by reflecting heat back away from the earth. The uh, rainforests are massive carbon sinks. They soak up some of this extra carbon in the atmosphere. But as warming continues, the rainforests dry, they shrink. And at some point, the rainforest will turn from carbon absorbers to carbon producers. And they will just then accelerate the entire process. As for the ice sheets, the tipping point may have already been passed. It may already be too late to prevent ongoing, continuing melting of the ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland. Now, scientific estimates do differ. There is a range. But there is a general agreement among scientists that by 2100, 90 years from now, um, the world could be as much as six degrees Celsius warmer. Now, ah, six degrees doesn't sound like much. Well, it may mean sound a little more to you when you realize that six degrees Celsius is about 11 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but that's if greenhouse gas emissions rise uncontrollably, if we do nothing. And again, six degrees, oh, it may not sound like a whole lot, but the fact is, this would be an environmental catastrophe. This would mean millions of miles of coastland inundated, underwater. It would mean loss of cropland. It would mean loss of freshwater supplies. It would mean the spread of, of insect-borne diseases and pest-borne diseases. It would mean the spread of pests for, for crops and foods. It would mean hunger. It would mean thirst. It would mean hundreds of millions of environmental refugees and probably resource wars as people battle for the shrinking food and water available to them. Despite that kind of urgency, the new global climate treaty that would actually put real restrictions on the worst producers, which basically are China and the U.S., we're the, by far the two biggest. The hope is that there will be a treaty by 2015 to be in effect by 2020. If we're lucky and there's not another delay as there has been delay after delay after delay. You know, one of the reasons we face this, we as Americans, is our role in this, one of the reasons we face this is frankly because we're lazy. We're, we're, just, we're just lazy. We don't want to face this. We don't want to deal with the possible inconvenience that dealing with global warming might cause us. So instead, we'd rather listen to the nitwits and the nut jobs. People like um, Senator James Inhofe going on about how global warming is a hoax. By the way, James Inhofe's actual middle name is Mountain, which I figure his parents gave him because they knew even at that point that he had rocks in his head. The point is, we would rather trust our health and our energy and, uh, and our futures to the very people who gain the most by lying to us about it. Um, this, this is insane. This is inane. So I'm going to ask you something. I asked you this before, several months ago, talking about global warming. I asked you this before. I'm going to ask you again now. I want you to think back 10, 15, maybe 20 years. You know, if, if you're as old as I am, yeah, think back to the 60s if you want. But just think back, like just 10, 15 years. Think of your life then. Think of what surrounded you. Think of the tech, level of technology that surrounded you, the level of conveniences that surrounded you. Think of the lifestyle that you had then. And I want you to ask yourself very seriously if living that way was so horrible that you would be willing to sacrifice a world and the future of your children to avoid living that way again. And we'll be back after a quick break. 
Hi, this is Larry Erickson, uh, host of Left Side of the Aisle here at uh, CCAT. And I just wanted to remind you and tell you about the open house. It's going to be happening down here at the CCAT studios on Saturday, June 16th from noon to 6. Come on down here, join us, see what's going on. There's going to be live programming, including yours truly and a lot of other folks as well. Uh, we'll show you how to work the cameras. We'll show you how to use the equipment. We'll show you how you can get involved in doing your own show or in, uh, in doing tech support or camera work or computer graphics for for other folks shows whatever you like come on down here and get involved this is community access television this is your station that's what this is about so you come on down here and you meet us all and find out what's going on and um, we'll see you then June 16th Saturday from noon to 6 at the studios of CCAT see you there And we're back. Hi there. Um, all right, as, as a footnote to everything that's gone before in the show, uh, on April 20th, 2010, was the date of the Deepwater Horizon disaster, the day when a oil well run by the BP Corporation like blew up, in essence, in the Gulf of Mexico. And over the next three months, it spewed something over 200 million gallons of oil into the Gulf. Um, well, uh, on Monday, it's just this past Monday, the, March 25th, after months of laboratory work, scientists had announced that they could definitively, definitively, conclusively identify oil from that blown out well as the cause for the massive damage to a coral community sitting at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico, a mile under the water and seven miles from the well. Uh, the bottom of the Gulf tends to be all muddy, but there are occasional colonies of coral, um, and um, those are vital oases for marine life in the area. They, they depend upon it. This colony has been severely damaged with unknowable future impacts on the marine life that depends on it. I'll tell you that this photo you see here, the, the pink thing you see in the photo is actually a starfish. The rest of it is the coral. That coral should be bright pink. Now, last spring, in one of my first shows here, I noted that it was the first anniversary of the Deepwater Horizon disaster. And I said at that time that you shouldn't believe the hype going around, that the Gulf was recovering or even had recovered. I said that was nonsense, that it was bogus, because the ecology of the Gulf is not very well understood yet. I mean, it's basically an ocean. Um, and what you might well see happening was what I called a slow motion disaster, with the effects accumulating over time. Now, nearly a year after that show, nearly two years after the actual, actual well blowout, we see newly determined proof of the damage that that blowout caused. Do not believe corporations. Do not believe they're paid flunkies in and out of public office. Do not believe those who have a selfish interest in lying to you. Do not believe those whose profit depends on keeping you passive and pacified. They are lying to you, and they will continue to lie to you as long as they can get away with lying to you, and they probably won't stop even then. Do not believe them. All right, going on to um, our regular weekly feature, the Outrage of the Week. Uh, first, a quick update. Uh, uh, that bill that I mentioned, I think it was last week or the week before, uh, in Outrage of the Week, the bill to, in Tennessee to sneak uh, creationism into schools through the subterfuge of calling it critical thinking about scientific theories, that bill has passed and it has gone to the governor for his signature. Well, this week's uh, show, uh, this week's Outrage, rather, comes from Indiana, which has proven to be a regular contributor to Outrage of the Week. Recently, an Indiana high schooler uh, named high school senior he is named Austin Carroll. He sent a tweet that contained some obscenities. Now, I'm going to tell you what he said. You just need to know that in place of the bleep in the original was 
the F word, okay? He said, this is the quote, bleep is one of these bleeping words you can bleeping put anywhere in a bleeping sentence and it still bleeping makes sense. Yeah, okay, it's kind of crude. Yes, it is. But although it's hardly beyond the reach of conversations I've heard, and I doubt it's beyond the reach of conversations you've heard as well. But it's still silly. It was obviously done as just a joke, just an attempt to be funny, okay? He was expelled from school. Now, he agrees the tweet was inappropriate, but expulsion? Just weeks before graduation? But the thing is, here's the real thing that got me about this, the real reason this gets outrage of the week status. The tweet was sent from his home on his own personal account. It wasn't done at school. It wasn't done on school grounds. It wasn't done during school hours. It had nothing to do with the school, which means the school is, in fact, asserting the authority to punish him for something done on his own time. That has nothing whatsoever to do with the school. And the school doesn't even have the limp justification of saying that this would somehow disrupt school or the educational process because, frankly, no one would buy an excuse that lame. And by extension, what this means is that the school is claiming that it can oversee and discipline, which means punish, any student for doing what the school thinks is inappropriate anytime, anywhere, regardless of its impact on the school. So here's, and by the way, here's a question may have occurred to you. How did the school even know about this since it turns out the tweet was sent at 2.30 a.m.? Apparently, when you log on to the school's computer, it scans all your tweets and records them. I'm oh, sorry, this, this is inane. But apparently nothing is too inane for Indiana these days. The current law in Indiana says that a student can be expelled from school for engaging, uh, even if it's off school, uh, if, engages in, if they engage in certain unlawful activity that result in disrupting the school. In January, the State House of Representatives in Indiana passed the bill to remove the word unlawful, which would empower schools to expel you for doing anything they thought you shouldn't, even if it was legal. And this, is, and this is part of a trend. I mean, uh, it's the trend of people with power always wanting more power over the people they have power over. Think of the thing about employers taking advantage of a tight job market to demand that job applicants turn over their Facebook passwords. Now, there has been some pushback. Facebook is threatening to, to uh, sue employers that demand this. And happily for students in Indiana, uh, the, um, the state Senate effectively killed this bill Uh, They uh, replaced it with a study commission on best practices in school discipline. But the fact is, um, the school is still arguing that you're under their authority day and night, everywhere and all times, and Austin Carroll is still expelled, and that is still the outrage of the week. So that's going to be it for me this week. I uh, hope that uh, I have um, got one minute left, which is just enough time for me to tell you that um, next week, I promise I am. I want to do it this week, no time. I want to talk about the jobs bill that just got passed. I think it's wonderfully named because it's a bunch of JOs pushing BS. So I'm going to be talking about that next week. But for right now, I'm going to say to you, just have the best week you possibly can. And uh, we'll be back next week. Hang in there.